Right, so, well, uh, thank you very much for, for joining this uh, first of what we hope to be a, a long and inspirational series of, of tech talks. They call the Audio Analytic Tech Talks. Uh, in terms of uh, Audio Analytic, you may know we're a company commercializing the uh, sound recognition, recognition of environmental sounds. Uh, we've achieved quite a bit of, of success in that sphere. Uh, some people would say we're, we're probably the leader in the, in the field. And in order to, to achieve that commercial success, of course, we've had to do uh, lots of research about sound recognition uh, to, to be where we are. Along the way of that research, we've met some great people. We've collaborated with great people. And this series of talk is, is, is a way to uh, uh, illustrate the, the things we learned with them and the things we uh, collaborated about. Uh, it's it's um, also a chance to spread uh, technology ideas, to talk about technology. These talks are going to be a bit more on the technology side of things than on the commercial side of things. Uh, and, and we hope you're going to find them interesting. Um, right, so to kick off this series, I'm very, very uh, happy and honored to uh, introduce uh, someone we've had the most successful collaborations with. Uh, please uh, give a big welcome to Professor Mark Plumley from the University of Surrey. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. One or two people I know from, uh, from a long time from here before. And thanks very much to Sasha and everyone at Audio Analytic for in inviting me to, to give the um, opening talk for, for the Audio Analytic uh, Tech Talks. So um, I'm from the University of Surrey, but I haven't had to come all the way up from Surrey uh, today because actually I live in Cambridge just near the station. So actually it's quite convenient for me to come here. What I'm going to be talking about today um, <coughs> is really how to make sense out of sounds, or I mean, in particular, how to build algorithms to make sense out of sounds. Um, and the work that I've been doing in this over the last few years has mostly been on the musical sound side, but more recently on non-musical environmental sounds, that sort of thing. And that's really where the collaboration with Audio Analytic has come in. So uh, over the next sort of 45 minutes or so, I'll give you a bit of a sense for where we've been looking at uh, some of these things. In particular, I'll talk about the idea of separating sounds, sound source separation, blind source separation, independent component analysis. You may have come across some of those terms. Um, and um, then some of the other things that we might want to do with music, extract notes out of a piece of music that you're listening to. How might we, uh, how might we do that? And also that then looking at the time dimensions, how, how you follow along the beats of a piece of music. So those are the sort of musical areas that I'll be looking at. And then I'll go on to the idea of analyzing non-musical sounds and then talk about some of the sort of environmental sounds, smart home type applications and so on with the, with the recent work here. So we're quite a small group. Um, I'm very happy to take questions as we go or just leave questions and answers to the end. So if, if there's something that doesn't make sense, then do let me, go on the, or, uh, do, do let me know on the way through. OK, and because I always forget to say thanks to everybody at the end, I've put it at the beginning instead. So a lot of the stuff that I've been to I'll be talking about here uh, is done with many people that I've collaborated, collaborated with uh, over the years. So these are just some of the people that I've worked with, uh, either at Queen Mary uh, or at Surrey. Um, and also particularly to, to funders like Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, um, Innovate UK that has funded the work with Audio Analytic and, and so on. So I'm going to start off by looking at the idea of separating out mixed sounds. And um, this is classically known as the cocktail party problem. So here's a sort of picture of what might be a cocktail party. OK, you've got lots of uh, sounds going on here. Um, and actually, this, this isn't a picture of a cocktail party. It's a workshop that, uh, that we had at Queen Mary. So it's not quite as interesting as that. But, the idea of the cocktail party problem actually comes from Colin Cherry from the 1950s. The idea that when you're in a noisy environment talking to lots of people, you can concentrate on listening to one conversation and filter out the other ones that are going on. It might be the person in front of you, it might be somebody nearby that happens to mention your name, but somewhere you can help to, to follow along with that. So we can simplify this into uh, an algorithm, a signal processing 
uh, version of how this is going to do. And I'm, I'm going to look at this for, I'm going to assume that some of you have got some maths, but not, not going to assume too much maths. If those of you really know the signal processing stuff, you can come and talk to me afterwards and I can, I can uh, talk to you about this. But the idea is you've got, let's say in the simplest case, two different sound sources. And you're going to mix them into two different microphones that will pick them up. For example, they might be your two ears and you've got two different speakers. And the mixing happens because some of each one of these sources gets picked up by each of the microphones. So if you listen to one of the particular microphones, it's got both sources with a different mixture. And if we want to put this mathematically, uh, we can write it in a sort of vector notation here. So we could say it's a vector of sources S, the two in here, a two by two matrix, which is our mixing matrix A, and a pickup of different microphones X here. So our challenge is that we want to undo this mixing process. And if we knew what our mixing matrix was, then our school maths would say we just find the inverse of that and multiply by that and everything comes out and that's fine. Um, but what happens if we only know the microphones and we don't know how it was mixed? And this is known as the blind source separation problem where all you've got are the mixtures, you don't know how it was mixed. So as a sort of illustration that one or two of you may have seen before, you can try something simpler than sound. So let's suppose that we just played with two independent die rolls. So this is not sound anymore, but something very much simpler. You get an amber die, dice uh, die A and a blue one B, um, and somebody's got a secret formula where they add the number A to sum of B, and we call this one X, so it might be half of A plus three of B. Um, another one, you do it with different amounts um, to give you a value Y, and this has got, let's say, two of A plus one of B, and all you're going to get to see are the numbers X and Y. You want to try and guess what the original numbers A and B were. Now, this is the sort of thing that we'd end up with, just these lists of numbers. But let's see what happens when we plot these out. If we plot X against Y, we can see a pattern here that shows how the mixing happened. And you can see, if you actually look along here, we've got a sort of straight edge that way, a straight edge that way, and because these are integers that we started with, you can actually see the original integers in the plot. Um, I've made the sort of circles spread out a little bit just for effect, just to show they're not on top of each other, but this means that only by knowing the values x and y, we can actually go back and work out what the original mixing values were and how to unmix them. So actually, we just look at the slopes here. The slope along here is 3 to 1. The slope along here is 2 to a half. And by using that, we can work out what our original mixing process was. That tells us what the mixing matrix was. And therefore, we can invert that and get the unmixed values afterwards. Um, now, there are a couple of minor details in there. We don't know how big the numbers were to start with, and we don't know whether we swapped them over. We don't know whether we've got A and B or B and A. But those are sort of trivial details that we're not re really worried about. But this is an illustration of something that we can do for more general mixtures. And so if we've got audio signals, we can use a similar technique to that. I'm not going to go into all the details. It's based on law of large numbers and making things non-Gaussian and so on. But if, you, if you're interested in it, ask me afterwards. But from here, we can use a method called independent component analysis that tries to find these underlying independent components behind it. So we might have uh, a microphone that picks up a, a mixture. One, two, three. OK, so we've got a mixture of people uh, speaking here, and then we'll unmix those sources after performing this independent component analysis. One, two, three. OK, now this is a, a classic method for source separation, and it works for more than two sources, 
but you have to have as many microphones as you have sources to get this to work. If you remember your stuff about matrix inversions, you can only do it if you've got a square matrix. So you've got to have as many microphones as you've got mixtures to do that. So this is fine if we've got two sources and two mixtures, or five sources and five mixtures, but if we want to separate out more sources, we have to take a different approach. So let's have a look at the sort of problems that we get with more mixed sounds. And this is a much more realistic situation for music, for example. So we've got a project at the moment called Audio Repurposing, which is about how to take two channel stereo sounds and remix or upmix the sounds into a larger number of channels. And so to do that, we'd ideally like to be able to pull out all those original sources that we had. But here, we might have, let's say, three original sources, but mixed down to two-channel stereo. So here we might have one guitar, um, a second guitar, and some drums down here. OK, and that gives us all a two-channel stereo mixture of everything mixed in together. OK, now if we try plotting this out with our scatter plot, this doesn't work anymore. We've got two mixtures, the left and right channel, but if we do the, the die roll trick, it's all over the place. We can't see where the mixtures are in this anymore. So instead of using one game of dice that we had to start with, let's see what happens if we change the rules a bit. So one of the things that we know about sounds is that sounds have particular frequencies that they occupy, and there are often gaps in between the things that we're looking at. So this, for those of you that are not familiar with this, this is a, a so-called spectrogram that shows time going along in this direction, frequencies going up in this direction. Um, this is um, an example from the uh, Timit data set. She had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. Don't ask. OK, well, um, th anyone that's done anything with speech recognition will recognize these classic um, uh, TIMIT data set uh, sentences. Um, some, some of the speech recognition community can recite them to you if you ask them. Um, but the, the main thing here is that you've got a high occupancy of time frequency boxes at multiples of the voicing frequency and gaps in between. So similarly for music, many musical instruments have this um, harmonic quality where they're at multi the, the, the sound is at multiples or near multiples of the fundamental frequency of the music and gaps in between. So that means that if we transform things into this time frequency space, we end up with what's called a sparse representation. We've got, instead of occupying all of the space that we could possibly use, many of the things in here are zero or very low. And this gives us a new way that we can um, approach this problem. So if we now think about a sparse version of the die roll problem, um, let's imagine that you're um, uh, sort of playing Monopoly and you're stuck in jail. You have to roll a six or something to get out. So in that case, unless you roll a six first, you're not going to score anything, and you only score something if you roll a six and then roll something else afterwards. So here, if you now plot what the scores are that you get from the mixture game, you now see that many of the times the values from your underlying sources are going to be zero, and only occasionally will you have one that pops up as non-zero. And that means that most of the time you'll find one of these sources is the one that dominates. And actually, if you then plot out the scatter plot, um, you'll see those come up as really strong values that you can see in your scatter plot. So although we've only got two directions here, we can now see the three values for where our mixtures are. 
And this is a, a die roll game, but in the case of sound sources, the left to right mixture will correspond to the direction that the sources are. And so this is really the approach that we take if we're trying to separate out more than two sources. We transform this into the time frequency spectrogram domain, and then we can see, just plotting the same sort of scatter plot, we can see these peaks that come out through here. And really what, what that's, what we're sort of saying about this problem is that if we see one of these peak directions, that tells us that, for example, we had two microphones here, that one of the sources comes from close to the left microphone, one of the sources comes from sort of a bit more in the middle, another one comes from a bit more to the right. And we're going to assume that each of these little time frequency boxes on our spectrogram, I'll just go back a little bit to the spectrogram, this is made up of a lot of little tiny boxes here, one at a particular time and frequency value, and we're just going to assume that only really one source dominates in that time frequency value. And if that works, then we can use this method to separate it. And we can think of it like colouring in our spectrogram different colours. So all the patches in this um, cone here will be ones that we colour in at a particular colour. And you end up with something that looks like this. So here you have um, a spectrogram. It's a little bit washed out here. I hope you can see that at the back. Can we turn these lights off at all, just the ones at the front? Um, I hope that won't mess with your exposure. No. Okay. It's always the last button. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, a couple more lights. Okay. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Okay. So, <laughs> thanks very much. Because otherwise, the blue one here is very difficult to see. There now. Hopefully, you can see uh, the blue one. Uh, we'll have the slides available afterwards in case anyone wants to look at that. But you can see here that there's a large amount of green, uh, and those correspond to the sort of time frequency bits where this guitar is present. Uh, there's a fair amount of red, and that really corresponds to this guitar, which is more on the bass side. And then there's the drums that you can sort of see these vertical bits where the, the drums come in. That's really where the drums are the loudest part, and a little bit along with the bass there. So we can actually hear these examples. So if I play along with this example. So let's hear what happens when we've tried to separate these. So um, this one, which actually is the loudest in most of the time, comes out fairly well. You can maybe hear a little bit of drum has sneaked in the background there. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the next one. The next guitar is also not too bad. If you listen to that over headphones, it loses a little bit of edge sometimes. Um, and then if we go into the drums, um, this is a bit more challenging. So the bass drum really dominates. These are quite nice speakers, actually. You can hear that. Um, but you still get some of the guitar coming through. And partly, this is one of the problems that you have with the, the drums are not a harmonic instrument. When the drum is on, it occupies all of the frequency components pretty much at the same time. Um, and so you hear bits of guitar coming in through as well. So. But this is really the approach that we're trying to take if you want to separate out more than two sources. This is some work we, with Andrew Nesbitt um, uh, back at Queen Mary. Um, but we, we're now looking to try and do higher quality audio source separation. So some of the things that you can do that, that help you with that is so-called score-informed source separation, where you actually know what the musical score is and you use that to try and help you to identify what frequencies you think the notes will occupy and when, and also what instrument it corresponds to. So that can give you quite a lot of information that can tie, could help you constrain this masking thing that you do to separate them out. 
Um, also been looking at some methods of using a, something called high resolution non-negative matrix factorization. So those of you that know about time frequency transforms, usually we just use the power spectrum to do everything and mask things out. But really there's lots of phase stuff going on in there. The exact timing of how the waveforms are shifted inside there make, makes a big difference. Um, so the recent project that we've been working on, on musical audio repurposing, a couple of things we've been trying to do to get, to get better uh, resolution from that. One of them is deep learning, of course. Everybody's doing deep learning at the moment. Um, so uh, I'm, at the moment we're trying to get some free GPU out of NVIDIA or something, so they're coming along to visit tomorrow. Um, but also we're looking at what high quality sound actually means. So a lot of the work that we've been doing here, the traditional ways of measuring how good you're doing are based on square differences, signal to noise ratio, that sort of thing. But our ears don't really measure things according to mean squared error and signal to noise ratio. So part of this project is to look at what is it that makes a separated source sound good or bad and for what purpose. And often when you're remixing something, uh, like a remixing app or you're up, up mixing something into five channel surround sound, you can make a lot of what might be seen as mistakes in the separation, but actually they're all hidden by the time you remix it again or up mix it. So we're looking at some of those things to see how that can really help us. Okay, so that's really what got me started into analyzing sounds into the separation um, separation side, but th this then made me think about other things that could be separated. And musical notes is another thing that you might want to separate. They're not separate sources anymore, but actually if you think of the different notes on a piano, in one way they are different sources of sound. On a piano, if you press the key, it makes a particular string vibrate at a particular frequency. If you press the one next to it, it's another spring at another frequency. Could you use these types of techniques to help you work out what the notes are playing? And one of the very common problems with the automatic music transcription problem, as it's known, is that several notes are playing at the same time. Here's a very simple list etude with two notes playing at once. But if we try and work out what the time frequency spectrogram is, each of those notes will have all of its multiples also appearing in here. Um, and this makes this problem a lot more challenging than it would do just if you had either a, a single note um, or if you were working from this, which is sometimes called a piano roll notation, based on the, the sort of old-fashioned player pianos where you put a piece of paper in and the, the black bits tell you uh, where it's going to press the keys down. So we need to go from here and try and get back to this representation here. Um, and actually we can use our sparse representations approach again because um, actually out of all the 88 notes that you've got on a standard piano, in this list etude you were only playing two at once. Many pieces only play a few. Um, it's very rare that you use your elbows to play more than three or four notes at once from here. And so what we want to build up is something where we find this original spectrum and this time the frequencies go along this way and we build it up out of separate notes that make up those. And here three notes being played at once would be enough to build up the spectrum that we're listening to there. And so this gets the idea that we start with this audio waveform where almost nothing is sparse, nothing is zero here. We go through our time frequency spectrogram where there are more gaps in here, so it's sparser, but we want to learn something that gets us to this much more like a, a piano roll representation where maybe only a couple of things are non-zero. And um, in fact, by building just an algorithm that will learn to decompose this time frequency matrix 
into a product where we force this to be as sparse as possible, what we actually pull out from this is um, a representation of each of all of the note frequency components in, in here. So this is work um, actually with Samer Abdallah, who's doing, my PH, uh, doing his PhD um, uh, with me back in the early 2000s. Um, and in this work, we've, we've taken this spectrogram and without knowing any musical information at all, um, have decomposed it into this. Uh, this is just rearranged in the right order and it makes a decent first stab. For something that doesn't know about music, you get something that doesn't sound great at the end of it, but it's actually got the essence of what you might want. So here's the, um, here's the original. This is a Bach partita played on a synthesized harpsichord. So it's not very lovely for those of you that like Bach. So you can sort of follow along the bits in there if you want to, where I think we'll stop that. Um, and this is a resynthesized version on a piano, just so you can see what notes it's actually pulled out and not pulled out. So where is our... Missed one. Okay, so, so we've, we've made a decent stab. For something that knows nothing about music, this has actually got quite a few of the notes out of it. Now, there are people in this room that uh, can do a lot better than this and have been uh, doing that themselves, and I'll introduce you to, to, to one later on if, you, if you're interested. So, hi, Emmanuel. Um, uh, so, the more realistic tasks than this, instead of using synthesized pianos, use real pianos, and actually you end up needing to use not just a single vector to represent each note, but actually many together. And so some um, more recent work I've been doing with um, Ken O'Hanlon, um, who's still at Queen Mary, so we're often having meetings over Skype uh, to finish off stuff, is the idea of using structured sparsity or so-called group sparsity, where you're allowed to have groups of things that can be on together. So this is a sort of refined version of things. So. Uh, in the case of a, a piano problem, you might say, you only have three or four notes on, but when that note is on, you can have any group of things representing it. Um, so there are new algorithms to do that as well, and that, include, that improves on the sort of results compared to just using a single sparsity model. Okay, so all of this stuff that I've been talking about so far has been just looking at things over time. So the sort of separation thing, I've been just looking at things at particular snapshots of time. Um, the music transcription, I've just been looking at snapshots of time. But now what happens with music is we want to look at what happens over time, um, so-called beat tracking. Um, I'm not going to really go into a lot of the details on here, but one of the useful techniques that you can base is the idea of, of um, so-called onset detection function, something that, that looks for typical sorts of beats in a piece of music. It's not quite as straightforward as you might think it might be to start with because it depends on the type of music that you're dealing with. Some music has very strong drum beats at, the, um, at particular beats and so you can use that to say, oh, when you have a loud thing at the be beginning, that tells you when your note onset is. Um, some of the more Challenging ones are things where you have something like a, a violin changing note or choral singers changing note. That can be much more difficult to follow along the beats. And so there are other ways that you can build that looking at, for example, the changes in phase over, over time. And for those of you that might have looked into sound, there are methods based on phase vocoders where you sort of predict what the, what the music is going to do next. And when, it, when you miss its prediction, you know something has changed and so that you might have had a beat there. Um, I think um, one of the, the fun things to do with beat tracking is that you can change quite a lot the character of music just by playing around with the beats. Uh, this is some work um, with, um, uh, uh, with Matthew Davis, um, uh, who um, who's, uh, was a PhD student and postdoc me at Queen Mary, went off to Porto. Where is Matthew now? Isn't he, is he now in Japan or still in Porto? Porto. Still in Porto, thank you. Um, so this was something where, where um, 
actually you start off with um, something with very regular beats. But you can um, analyze something else that would have a very different beat structure to it. Um, I'll leave YouTube to work out how much of that you can play without it being um, uh, taken down for, uh, for copyright or something. Um, and here you get a new version, which actually I like better than the original. But anyway. So um, then there's a thing to, to keep to time, I'll, um, I have a short um, video here that I can, I can play at the end, but um, some other work that um, I've done with Andrew Robertson, um, who's, um, who's now working for Ableton in Berlin and building in some of these ideas into uh, uh, the Ableton Live system, is how uh, to get this beat to be done in real time as part of a real performance. And just to set the context here, um, you may have gone to, to performances of bands where the drummer is at the back wearing a pair of headphones, listening to a click track, drumming along to the click track, because the backing music is set and the drummer has to keep in time with that. So Andrew's idea was, let's get the computer to listen to the drummer instead and then change the timing of the backing track to fit with what the drummer's doing instead of getting the drummer to drive, be driven by the backing track. So um, this is really a tough problem to, to make happen in a, a real, uh, real performance. There's, there are a lot of parameters that you can set up for a particular, um, particular performance and it can learn more about what you're trying to do. Um, but um, there's a, just a, a, a little extract um, here there's a, a video that I think I've got time to play this one before we get on to the, the next bits that I can uh, I can show through here so let's uh, let's play this one so it's starting quite slow it will build up faster as we go through and this is a robot glockenspiel where the timing of this is set by the beat tracking algorithm. So you can get the sense now that we've sped up quite a bit now. And it's still keeping in time with the drummer. So if you were trying to keep up in time with this, you'd have quite a job by now. And of course, you've got to decide what to do when the drummer stops. So in this case, it just keeps on at the same rate until somebody presses the stop button. <laughs> Great, okay, 
Um, so this is uh, Andrew Robertson's beekeeper system, David Nock on the drums, and Dave Meekin's um, uh, robot glockenspiel. So um, just to sort of uh, finish off um, here, the, the last part I wanted to talk to was about non-music sounds. So I started in this work on non-music sounds, but so many of the things that are in musical sounds that I've been talking about, but so much of our environment is about non-musical things. But there's quite a lot that we've learned about the musical analysis that we've done that could be applied to things that are not just music. So um, things that are going on, the bus going through puddles outside of the, of the window, um, alarms, uh, the sort of security applications that Audio Analytica are, are working on. Um, and some, a lot of these are used as communication. And as human beings, we use sound a huge amount as something complementary to our vision. For vision, you have to be looking in a particular direction to be able to see something. But sound you can pick up from all around the place. If something is in front of something else, it's occluded in vision. But in sound, you hear it um, even if it's behind a wall. You'll still hear, hear the sounds creeping through from behind the wall. Um, so some of the new directions that come up, I mentioned about security applications. Um, the idea of sort of legacy Internet of Things. Everybody's talking about Internet of Things at the moment, IoT, but lots of things like my microwave at home or your smoke alarm might go off and make a sound that you're supposed to listen to, but these could be devices that could be put into the Internet of Things by monitoring those. Assisted living applications. Could you have something that listens to somebody at the home just to make sure everything's all right or raised an alarm if there's something unusual? As well as environmental monitoring like logging or, or bird sounds or maybe medical sounds and so on. So there's quite a lot of potential in there and a lot of this is really un, un, underexplored at the moment. Most of the work that's been going on in analyzing sounds has firstly been going on speech for you know, since the 1930s almost, but, but seriously since the 1950s and 60s. Um, and music, particularly since the, um, since the 1990s, 2000s. Um, and, um, and so now the non-speech, non-music, which still doesn't really have a nicer name to it, um, is, is something that I think is a really interesting direction to go into. Um, one of the things that, that we had a small uh, project on, um, this was with uh, visitor Fabio Hedaioglu from, um, uh, uh, from Portugal, um, was um, trying to separate out heart sounds. Um, so this is the application for this is that it's actually a really uh, challenging problem. You've got four valves to listen to in the heart and normally when a, a clinician will listen to the heart they'll place the stethoscope in four different places that are sort of nearer to the different valves. Now we could use independent source, uh, in, uh, in, uh, independent component analysis to do blind source separation if we had a sort of four-headed hydra stethoscope, but nobody would carry one of those around with you with them. So the idea of this project was to try and and use this sequential um, uh, auscultation, it's called. To, um, uh, to pick up the different sounds from that. Um, it was, we had some um, work that we got from that. I'd say it's, it's still a long way from being done, um, but we were trying to use this sort of sequential and repetitive nature, nature um, to pull out um, uh, separated heart, heart sounds. So that one, I think, is something that, that really is an interesting application, really needs more work on that, I think. Um, Birdsong identification, this is work with, uh, uh, with Dan Stowell, um, who, um, who now has a, um, a fellowship funding by the um, uh, Engineering and Physics, Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, here, looking at, at things like, um, well, chirp analysis um, of a wavelet type of analysis, and also using deep learning-like principles, so-called feature learning ideas, not quite exactly the same as the deep learning methods that people are talking about, but it can help with bird song recognition and in a uh, bird identification challenge last year, um, uh, Dan's system uh, came up with the uh, top audio only um, uh, recognition performance from that and had a nice little 
uh, article in BBC News and, and various other things. Um, there is uh, now um, an iPhone app called Warbler, W-A-R-B-L-R, um, for this, which I forgot to put on this slide. But uh, if you've got an iPhone and you want to try it out, then do download that. Don't play bird songs from tape or whistle at it or something. It's actually designed to work when your iPhone is outdoors listening to real sounds. But you'll be surprised how many times they've got recordings of people going, rock, rock, <laughs> into, <laughs> into their applications, see what it will recognize. So they almost need a human recognizer as well as a bird song recognizer for that to work. Um, then moving on to environmental sounds, one of the things that's actually holding back research in this is area, we think, is that there isn't much data for people to work on. If you're working on speech, there are decades worth of speech. If you're at Google or um, Amazon with the Amazon Echo or, or, um, or Apple with the iPhone, you've got billions of hours of speech data that you've been merrily harvesting from people that you can use to train your recognizers on. For environmental sounds, although it's around, nobody's really been Cap capturing much of it for the research environment to use. So one of the things that we, um, uh, uh, we had some work on, and actually um, Emmanuel Benitos was uh, helping as part of some of this as well, was to gather um, some sounds of, of sort of street type environments, a busy street uh, or a metro. These were recorded around Queen Mary in East London. Um, as well as some office sounds as well, and classifying them together and forming a challenge to encourage people to work in this. And we had a special session at a conference a couple of years ago for this. And there's a huge range of things, many of the, you, them using so-called melt frequency capsule coefficients, which are a very popular speech recognition pre-processing thing. No particular reason why they should work with environmental sounds, but it's a sort of, it's the first thing that you grab as a feature detector if you're, if you're going to try and pull these things out. Uh, but quite a range of other things about people using brain-inspired um, spectrotemporal receptive fields and cochleograms and wavelets and so on. So actually it was, it was a very nice way of seeing different approaches to these together with uh, classification using uh, things like support vector machines and radial basis functions and uh, uh, hidden Markov models and so on. So actually it's a really nice way of seeing a range of the sorts of things that, that, that came up in here. Uh, what we found really was that most systems were, were better than our baseline. Actually one of these is, is, is uh, slightly changed since this graph. Um, and um, actually the best ones just about got up to human uh, performance. Um, but being sneaky, uh, we were able to do slightly better just by voting on all the other ones that everybody else had to go at. So, um, so you just take a majority vote of all the other systems and that performs slightly better uh, than all the other ones there. Um, so there's um, uh, an IEEE multimedia paper that's just come out describing this sort of process so that you can look at, at those and the challenges and the methods. Um, and looking at the smart home stuff, that was mostly from outside or office environments. This is really the work with audio analytics. So we've had a couple of projects funded by Innovate UK. They used to be known as Technology Strategy Board, hence Technology Strategy Board in little letters on the, underneath. Um, and, um, and so we've been um, uh, looking at uh, an advanced smart microphone project, an audio data exploration project. Um, to, uh, to look at more the indoor type of applications. And I think that seems to be, um, for, from the commercial perspective, that's, that's really where um, this Internet of Sensors uh, idea uh, is really interesting just at the moment. Um, so, um, and along the lines of, of that, um, we've uh, recently, uh, as part of one of those projects with the academic part, it's fine if you're working with a commercial company like Audio Analytic to work with data, but actually the data is the thing that gives you the commercial edge to be able to work on. So we wanted to also help other researchers to have a go at the indoor sounds as well. So as a parallel activity, we used some sounds that were actually recorded by uh, John Barker in Sheffield as background noise for a speech recognition task and added labels to that so that it be could become a domestic sound recognition task. So these were recorded in, in his home, uh, a Victorian semi-detached house, 
Um, there's about seven hours of recordings in this, in this particular one and allocated into, into chunks. Um, it's actually a really challenging labeling task. Um, so there isn't ground truth because we weren't there, the labelers weren't there. You were told roughly how the setup was, but they had some, some disagreements there. And so in the end, out of three labelers, um, we took as, quote, ground truth anywhere two labelers agreed on all the labels. And that was true in about 45% of the chunks. So more than half of the time, they all thought they were different. And I think this has told us something about how we need to gather data in the future. We need much more extra information, maybe videos of things so that you can tell what's going on uh, as well as sounds, or maybe um, noting what's happening where it's there. So um, um, some decent baseline performance from here from, a, 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 again, MEL frequency kepstrel coefficients plus a Gaussian mixture model. So we're doing a baseline to give people something to start with. But this will be part of a 2016 version of uh, this, the, this uh, D case challenge that we talked about before. And this one is sort of being done with, um, uh, with Tampere University of Technology as well, who've got some other things there. But if you want to play with this, the details are on archive the URL at the bottom. So just to mention a, a future project, we've just got some funding from Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council for a project called Make, Making Sense of Sounds, hence the title for this, for this talk. Um, and this is a joint project with uh, University of Surrey and Salford and various partners including Audio Analytic, uh, are one of the, the partners advising the project here. Uh, we also have BBC R&D, a couple of other partners as well, including New York University, uh, who are working on, on sounds in the city. They're very interested in the annoying sounds that happen in the middle of a big city and how they can help monitor and can control those. And we are hiring. So uh, we're currently looking for postdoctoral uh, researchers, one uh, in directly in the machine listening technology, but another one in semantic audio-visual processing. So we're interested in how vision and audio go together and how this can help with labeling of machine data because we don't have the labels for this stuff at the moment. So, so that's a very interesting area. To follow, we'll also be recruiting a research software developer um, and uh, Salford will also be research, um, recruiting a postdoc in the sort of psychology of sound area, what it feels like to be in a city with all these sounds going on. So that's, uh, that's really uh, it for, for my talk. So just to conclude, I think analyzing musical sounds and non-musical sounds are really challenging and interesting topic. I've hoped to give you a bit of an overview here of the sorts of things that, that uh, I've been working on and been interesting in over the last few years. I think there are quite a lot of promising tools in things like sparse representations. Deep learning now, but deep learning does have its drawbacks. You need bunches of huge amounts of data to work with at the moment. We don't have that and that could be holding us back. So new projects, watch this space. And if you know people that are looking for a postdoc job, then let me know. Thank you very much.